Gold jewelry has been a symbol of wealth and status throughout the ages. Today, though, it isn't just for the rich. Even ordinary people are likely to have a gold ring or necklace, just a little less diamond studded. <laughs> As early as 2000 BC, Egyptian kings and queens adorned themselves in gold and jewelry encrusted with precious gems. When the Spanish sailed to the New World in 1492, they discovered Mayan and Aztec masterpieces of colored stones and pure gold. Today, elaborate gold jewelry and precious gems are well beyond the reach of the average person, except for the diamond ring, still the customary symbol of engagement. The client and the jewelry designer first decide how the ring will look. The designer then measures the client's finger to determine her ring size. He then sketches out the design they've agreed upon, a grooved band with three diamonds. The model maker works with a special carving wax. Using a compass, he measures off and marks a width of the band, then carefully saws it off. He takes his millimeter gauge and puts it on a stick with ring size markings called a mandrel. He adjusts his compass to the ring size, then scores the finger hole on the block of wax. He then takes his drill and carefully carves out the hole he scored. Then he grinds off the wax on the outside of the band. Using the compass again, he scores the middle of the band where he'll make the groove. Then, using a very fine drill bit, he carves out the groove. With a file, he then refines the groove and shapes the curves of the ring according to the design. After putting wax prongs on the band, he attaches a wax stem to the model. He then positions the stem into the base of the cylinder that the jeweler will use to cast the ring. The base goes onto the platform of a vacuum machine. The jeweler puts a cylinder on top of the base, then pours in a special plaster. The vacuum sucks all the air out of the plaster. This is a key part of the process, because if any air bubbles remain, the finished ring will be out of shape. In less than a minute, the vacuuming is done, and the cylinder goes into the furnace at 1,350 degrees Fahrenheit. The wax model evaporates, leaving a void the exact shape of the ring in the hardened plaster. Next, they melt the gold. The gold content of jewelry is measured by carat. The lower the carat, the less gold and the more alloy, cheaper metals such as nickel, silver and copper. After five hours, the cylinder comes out of the furnace and goes into the casting machine. The machine spins for about a minute. The centrifugal force shoots the liquefied gold into the plaster mold that's inside the cylinder. The jeweler then immerses the cylinder in cold water. This cools the gold and makes the plaster disintegrate. What's left is the cast gold ring, but its surface is rough. So, on to the finishing process. The jeweler saws off the stem and gets to work. He files and grinds the ring until the surface is smooth. Then he stamps on his trademark and the carrot marking. Then he hammers the ring on the mandrel to make it perfectly round. The jeweler then hands off to a specialist in polishing. The polisher runs the ring against a series of buffing wheels until it's bright and shiny. The polisher then hands off to a specialist in setting gemstones. The setter straightens the prongs that'll hold the diamonds. Then, with a delicate drill bit, he carefully carves out the inside of the prongs. The edges of the diamonds will fit directly into these slots. He readjusts the prongs, then sets the diamonds, making sure the prongs hold them down securely. That's a one-carat diamond in the middle. 
a half carat diamond on each side. The jeweler then immerses the finished ring into the ultrasonic machine. The vibrations in the water penetrate every nook and cranny, washing the ring. Finally, he puts the ring under a jet of hot steam to blast away any remaining residue. And voila, with a ring like that, who wouldn't say I do?